Our next speaker is Keith Wiley. For decades, first as head gardener at the Garden House, and now in his own garden at Wildside in Devon, Keith has been evolving a style of gardening based on modifying natural landscapes from around the globe. Anyone who has seen his gardens comes away excited by the creative ways he uses plants to evoke experiences with wildness. We are looking forward to hearing him walk us through his gardening process, from conception and design to implementation and management, all in pursuit of spectacular, naturalistic garden effects. Please join me in welcoming Keith. Thank you, Amy. Can you all hear me? Yeah, that's OK. We're going to go down market now, I'm afraid, after that. Slightly, slightly less intellectual than we just had, I'm afraid. We're going to be quite personal. Uh, I would describe the way that Ros and I garden uh, as being principally to create a spectacle that is pleasing on the eye with a strong ecological undercurrent. We want to grow as many plants as possible in a wider range of conditions as possible and habitats and to make them look as natural as we can. And we hope in the process that we'll attract a, wild, a, a lot, a wide range of wildlife to inhabit it. And this is, has proved to be the case. Uh, I would say that there are two recurring themes that are behind all the schemes that I've ever done. And those are, and in a way it's exemplified by this picture, which I took when we were still students up on Sky uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, and that is shape with a P and light. Shape both of the land itself. Is this, am I getting feedback here? Shape of the land itself and of the plants which add, of course, structure and mood to the garden that you're creating or the planting that you're doing. And the other one is light, which adds an ever-changing subtlety uh, and sparkle to those plantings. But I want to start at where I started my professional career uh, over 40 years ago, at the Garden House in Devon, where these naturalistic style sort of took root. And here what happened is that we started to allow plants that were growing as groups of things, we allowed them to start self-seeding and spreading in between it. And I, I came there as head gardener after graduating, and to the internal credit of the chap who was working, my, my other gardener, staff of two, head gardener of two, uh, he embraced this and actually started to uh, allow self-seeding to take place. And you can see that groups of plants that were there started to become much more informal, much more dreamy, much more romantic. And further up the slope, where the soils were more acid, rhododendrons were growing really beautifully together, uh, and... We get a lot of rainfall down in our part of the world. We get 60 inches of rain, 150 centimeters of rain. That's a lot of things. And a lot of plants grow much quicker than the books will tell you they do. And here, dwarf rhododendrons, which were supposed to be two feet high, actually grew four foot high. And they grew into each other and through each other. And it seemed to me that we had a much more natural looking combination of plants. And near where I live on Dartmoor, all the trees were very often very twisted and trunk, multi-trunked, anything but straight, basically. And if you look at the shape of these trees, and then when I went to Crete, you look at the shape of these oak trees, you'll see that they're very, very similar. But on the ground in front of it, we've got cistus, just around the corner from where I was looking, where I took this picture, there were two-foot-high ground orchids. So what we're looking at here is a something that was very familiar to me, from our, but in actual fact it was just filled with garden plants, plants that I was growing in the beds. And sort of a light bulb moment started to happen a little bit, really. We saw meadows that were like Impressionist paintings, just with annuals. So the idea of the flower meadows that we were used to in England 
suddenly this was changed into something that was really very beautiful in its own right. I noticed that the way that flowers actually often congregated around stone walls, where the farmers had thrown the stones up onto the side of the banks, and they couldn't cultivate these areas, and that's where the wild flowers grew. I noticed that this was very similar in, it, in actual fact to little woods that I knew when, when I was a child. They might have been hawthorns that we were looking at, Cretaceous species in, in my childhood, but here the olive trees. And it was about looking at, I, I put my pointer here, but I'll have to do it on one screen or the other. I'll do it on this screen over here for a minute. I, I mean, you get rocks in there. You get things like the Flomis and the evergreens that are there. And that format, that basic template, could be taken away and used as a garden really very, very easily. But what you also got in Crete is that you looked up and you saw where the flowers were, a view of the mountains in the background. Now, I came back to Devon, and this was the view that we had from the garden at the, at the garden house. I mean, to me, that is a quintessential view of Devon. Uh, I love the way that that wood behind there looks like the Almighty's run a hedge trimmer over the top of it. Beautiful shape. And I had a four-acre field that we started to develop in front of this that I thought, uh, if I put any sort of formal garden there, it would have clashed with that landscape. So looking at the space with a very wide-angle lens here, which has actually made the hills and everything look much smaller, you will see that what I actually did is that we created a series of walls here that mirrored the shape of the hills in the distance. And that wood that I showed you, I actually made a, little, a group of prostanthra there, and I shaped it to mirror it. So what I was trying to do was to subconsciously link that landscape back into the garden so that you knew, didn't know where one began and where the one finished. And if you looked around the corner from where this picture was, I actually, we built a little ruin here. And this one is really coming back to childhood memories. Childhood memories of little sort of tumble-down buildings that I would explore as a child, uh, where a lot of us actually our roots in naturalistic planting or the wild landscapes took place. At least in my generation, certainly that was the case. Now, the farmyards when we were children were actually not the nice, clean places that they are now. They were really, there'd be a place where the dung heap was that would be covered in stinging nettles and brambles. All right, you'd get rusted farm machinery in it. And if you think about it, that in itself doesn't sound like much of a template for a garden. But if you substituted shrub roses for those brambles, you substituted flowers for the stingy nettles, you substituted a granite trough for that rusting farm machinery, you end up with something that's very, very different. You end up with something really quite romantic. And this picture taken three months, this piece taken three months later, you can see that the wildflowers are actually coming in here. Pink campion here is actually covering the ground. I actually used plants that had the same basic shapes as our native species, but I actually used them slightly larger flowered versions of it. I'll come back to that in a little bit. And the beauty about naturalistic planting, or this style of planting, is that actually you can get waves of color coming from the same space. So six weeks later, it looked like this. And the pink campion you can see has actually gone to seed. That's creating the brown patches in there. And you can grow all sorts of colors all together. It's gardeners who worry about color clashes. Nature doesn't worry about color clashes when you actually just drizzle the colors through each other. And there's nearly every color in the rainbow in there, but they don't clash. And then later on, of course, you get the seed heads. And the seed heads attract insects. They attract birds that come and eat the insects. You actually start getting uh, it very full. What I also like about this, and I come back to those two things that I talk about, is the effect of light coming through the plants. So here in another part of the garden, we actually were growing grasses with Michaelmas daisies, but what really happens where you get the magic is when the evening light drops down and you get that golden light, and you get this wonderful effect of the, of the light streaming through the grasses in the evening.
not something necessarily for a public garden, but something when you're having a private garden, it, you can put real magic into the garden for maybe five, ten minutes. Now, I, I thought that, that worked okay with perennial plants, but I, I mean, I thought, why not try it with alpines as well? As I said, it's a wide range of plants in a wide range of habitats. I mean, there's lots of different alpine meadows, of course, but the one that I quite liked was actually the one that they cut uh, for the hay meadows. And it's very, very different from an English flower meadow, if you think about it. I mean, that's absolutely stuffed with flowers, isn't it, really? Really very beautiful. And they cut it with wonderful Swiss efficiency at 11 o'clock on July the 7th every single year. And that would be more like what we would consider this is at the garden house. There's an English meadow that's in the middle. In a proper English meadow, you might well have a lot more yellow rattle and orchids in there. But I thought I'd make a sort of version of the Swiss meadow up here. Uh, and there it is. It it's actually has got Swiss plants in it, but it's not sort of deliberately being Swiss. All these plants will be cut down immediately after flowering and they'll actually come back up and be much stronger for the following year. And you can use garden varieties of these plants in this and that still works extremely well. This is Estrantia Hadsman blood and it works just as nicely if you look at that picture with the buttercups behind it as it does with the century and the campion in the foreground there. And this piece is a piece that I actually planted. And at this point, I will actually mention a, a, a little story that I had. I had a, an Irish gentleman, a middle-aged Irish gentleman, and he was nearly in tears when he met me at this point in the garden. And he said that all his life, He'd wanted to see the flowers of his childhood that he saw on the west coast of Ireland when he was a lad. And for the first time today, he'd seen them. I didn't have the heart to tell him that not one of those plants grew on the west coast of Ireland. The point was he thought they did. He thought they did. What do you think? And if you think about it, when we're children and we work, go into a field of oxeye daisies, those flowers are up by our chest. When we're grown up and you go into the same oxide daisy field, they're down by your knees. The, s the effect is not the same. So what I did is I actually used flowers that are the same shape as those natural ones, but they're larger, they're bigger, they're more in your face. It, these things grow in a Swiss meadow, but we don't get Amplexicoli, uh, Persicaria Amplexicoli superba in there. You get little bistorts with little white flowers. But by having them with much bigger flowers, it makes you think that it's of, it reminds you, it's this nostalgic feeling. It's about playing with people's emotions and people's memories, and it's an extremely powerful way to actually garden. And I thought, well, I say, well, you, why not with, why not with uh, bulbs? I mean, here, Cyclamen repandum looks really very nice, but it looks much nicer when you grow it with some friends a lot. You get something very, very different. And here we move on to actually still bulbs. Actually, sorry, come back to there. This is not, not in our garden. This is in South Africa. This is Darling, the Wayland's Nature Reserve, about 70 miles north of Cape Town. And I was very fortunate to be able to go there and see it in flower. And you can see it was looking absolutely magnificent with this powder blue heliophylla. And, and I can't remember what this orange flower is. I, 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 it may have been in Ursinia. I can't remember. Uh, but uh, James would tell us later on. Uh, but it, it was beautiful. And I was very, very fortunate that I was able to go back three weeks later and it looked like this. Completely and utterly different. Now, the point about this is that with bulbs and small plants, you can actually get waves of color coming from the same place. So actually, you can get a long succession of ever-changing sort, of no, uh, sort of patterns of plants on the ground. Now, I came back, and we had this area of the garden that was actually surrounded by big, big magnolia trees, big magnolias and a lot of things like photinias, and Certifilums, Katsura trees, which came out with purple young foliage. And I thought it would be really nice to just make a sort of bulb meadow in the middle of it. 
Uh, I never really took decent pictures of the area because we're always so busy in, in April to do it. But you can see what we were trying to do was to create just this carpet of, of flowers, really rather a lot like James's uh, private garden really there, but trying to make it, because I had more space, trying to make it look uh, more natural in a more natural setting amongst those big magnolias. I'm very fortunate that we had space. And then in the garden, I mean, that was a bit of bulbs a little bit. Why not with alpines? This was an area of garden where I actually took everything out of the bank and replaced it with creeping thyme. And the white flowers there are rhodohypoxis, little bulbs from South Africa. And it was a very popular part of the garden, down in the wall garden that we had down there. But it was north-facing. But I took the concept and we made it rather bigger. Took the same thing and did it on a bigger scale much, much bigger scale, so that it covered the whole ground. And looking at it from a different angle there, you can see that it's just forming these carpets of, of, of flower there. I was very fortunate, of course, that I can do this, I can do this, and you can actually then move on to another piece of the garden when it's not looking so good. But it's about the shape. It's shaping the ground itself in there as well. But it still works. Oh, I was coming there. This is still on the Alpine area, really. These are the Tembler Hills in, in, in California. And, and certain times of the hill, these, these hills in, in California, inland from San Luis Obispo, they will get covered in wildflowers. And I've been three times to see it and missed it every time. 6,000 miles and you miss it, but I do love the shape of these hills that you get in California, these rounded hills, and I love the way that these oak trees were making this wonderful shape on these dry brown hills. And so I, I came back, and actually what I had is I had a whole series of bonsai trees that were exactly the same shape as those oak trees look. And I rounded the hills and made them in sort of reminded me roughly of those Tembler ones. And instead of wildflowers, I covered the whole lot with rhodohypoxis and dwarf pinks. And it just reminded me of the Tembler hills there, uh, of actually what we were doing there with that. And on a small scale, you can do, I mean, I say we've done it on a very big scale in places, but this was on, even in a little small place, you can actually have really a lot of detail going on in here with sedums and uh, pinks and creeping time, and in actual fact, all the way through here, you can see a little yellow plant. It's, it's tormentil. It's a, a, a weed, really. Um, and what are we doing for that? Just let me see what my time is there. Yep. Uh, it's a weed, really. Uh, and I actually had one of my ladies actually came along, and she weeded out every little bit of tormentil in that piece. It looked like the mice had had a rally cross through the middle of it. Uh, the point was, it was a weed in her garden, but it wasn't a weed in mine. Uh, I wanted to encourage weeds to be amongst the flowers if, if they were pretty. And it's also about looking closely. It's about looking closely at plants sometimes, looking at the detail of the creeping thyme here and this little allium palens, which is only six inches high, or the tick seed flowers uh, in North America where they're actually just catching the light. It's, also, it, it's about looking closely. It's not all about on the big scale. But on the big scale, you can't get much more big scale than going down into Namaqua land and seeing the flowers there. This is the uh, Kamish crew, uh, this is um, a skill pad, a skill pad in Namaqua land. Flowers absolutely staggering. I mean, I mean, the flowers in South Africa are just something else. Absolutely. Just look at them. Absolutely incredible. I mean, it's difficult to go there and not be completely blown away by the expanse of flowers that there are down there. And I did, and I was, and I came back, and I thought, I've got to have a little bit of a slice of this somehow. So what we did is we made up a bed at the garden house here. I put nine inches of compost down. I put nine inches of sand on the top, uh, and I bought some seeds back from South Africa, and I planted them. And three months later, it looked like this. And I thought, I quite like that. I'll get rid of the grass. Grass has got to go. So a year later, it looked like this. Uh, and did it work? What, what it is, is that flowers in South Africa, of course, flower for a very short time, relatively. They flower for about three weeks up in Namakwaland. And then they spend 49 weeks of the year as seeds, waiting for the winter rains to come back, to bring them back to life again next year. 
And what I was trying to do with the compost underneath was to make the plants think that they were in South Africa in their tops, but England in their roots, so that they flowered for a very long time. And did it work? Yes, it did. They flowered for a very long time, these plants. They flowered basically all summer. Now, I, actually, you can see, see that what I did is I went overboard with it, really. Uh, I, I really liked the whole flower element of this. And I started putting, nobody else was able to weed this, you can tell. I mean, this was my patch. Okay, keep off it, this is mine. Uh, uh, but I did love it. It wasn't a huge area, um, but it was absolutely stuffed with plants. And, and uh, you can see the poppies loved it. Poppies do not like my part of Devon. 60 inches of rain, 150 centimeters of rain is not good for poppies. They loved the sand, absolutely went crazy in it. And a year or two later, you can see, as James was talking about, in actual fact, the variety of things is limited, is coming down. The number of species, the number of things in it are not. But other plants are coming along, and they're actually just sort of taking over and making a much more stable community of plants. Potentilla rectora warrenii, the pale yellow one here, is seeding itself all over the place. Uh, the Tanacetum nivium here, the white one, is actually doing it. And what I wanted to do with this one is actually to show you that if you look at the color distribution there is through that, not the colors themselves, but the color distribution, and then you look at the color distribution of flowers in South Africa, you will see that they are actually really rather similar. There is some similarities between it. I went to this place, I mean, this was an amazing uh, place. I mean, there was hundreds of acres of this. Uh, I, I knew that the big one upstairs put flowers together in a, a, a sort of nice way. I, I thought that what I did was take nature and enhance it. You realize when you see nature like this that you're preposterously arrogant to even think that you're improving on nature. There is absolutely, I knew the big one put them together in nice taste, but I had no idea that he, she, could put it together with such consummate good taste. I mean, it is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And what you can't see from that picture is the number of other species that there are in that. There was as many as 20 or 25 different species in each square meter of space. Absolutely staggering it was. And here, this is a little tiny section of that in the wild. And what it would be, it's rather silly to think that you could take flowers from South Africa and you could grow them on a north slope in Devon with 60 inches of rain. So I actually used a lot of Californian seeds, which are actually much more tolerant of wet conditions, and actually planted them and sowed the seeds here. And we got the same sort of effect. I added some annual grasses and some annual, uh, like that little omphalodes in there, and you can see that the effect is, is really still really quite nice. And this plant, mesmer, uh, the mesmeranthemum, is one of the first flowers that I ever really loved as a child. Absolutely beautiful. I love the way that the light bounces off the petals and actually uh, sort of uh, bounces back, like it's got sort of coated in sugar coating, sugar icing or something like that. And they were growing in South Africa on the high water mark, just amongst driftwood and things like that. And I came back and I planted them amongst some driftwood that you can see here, and with some rhodohypoxis. And instead of growing them amongst lovely gravel, I, had, I could only afford pretty horrible grey gravel. But the concept was nice. For the first time in my life, I was starting to grow uh, mesobranthemums in a way that I thought they looked right. They felt right for the first time. And then you can move on. I mean, here, these are uh, uh, the hazel coppices that you get in Kent. Here, just with bluebells and wild garlic underneath them. But it was the shape, the structure of what you see there with the trunks. The trunks of these trees are forming the feeling of this area. And if you look at that shape and then you look at the next picture, this is at Wildside where we are now, I used magnolias to do the same thing. I planted magnolias very close together. I mean, the books will tell you that magnolias should be planted at 40 foot, high, uh, 40 foot wide spacings. And I say, who says? Just because they're normally planted at 40 foot wide spacings doesn't mean it's the only way you can grow magnolias. Why not grow them as if they're 
actually a hazel coppice. They actually form beautiful, they've got beautiful trunks, a lot of magnolias, as they get older. They're silver, like bar birches. They get very wonderful lichen growth on them. And they're actually a beautiful a background for the bulbs and things that you can get underneath. Or the olive trees that you get in, in the Mediterranean. Now, I love olive trees. They're going to be borderline, really, very borderline. And to get them at this age, I'm going to have to be about 150 before I can actually see them or have very deep pockets. But I love the idea of them. So actually, what I did was actually use Eliagnus quicksilver to give me the same effect. Now, Eliagnus quicksilver is actually a suckering shrub. Uh, uh, and what I did is select some of the trunks and turn them into this. And you look down through there, and you could be looking down at Wildside through olive trees with the silver trees down into the courtyard garden beneath it. Peter was telling, Peter Korn was telling me that Eliagnus angustifolia will do the same thing, but that its flowers smell rather unfortunate, let's say that. Uh, Eliagnus angustif uh, sil uh, quicksilver, actually the flowers are beautifully scented, really, really lovely scented. Or at Wildside in the courtyard garden, these trees themselves actually create the sense of this being a sort of southern hemisphere type looking garden, really. They, they are responsible for the mood of that particular part of the garden. Here, when I was over in North America, I, these are my favorite plants, actually. I mean, erythroniums are, I have a particularly soft spot for erythroniums. Uh, we went over there and saw them, and we saw these er uh, erythronium citrinum growing underneath manzanita bushes, Arctostaphylos. And it was in the evening light, and actually, you can just about see, if you look at the back, that the trunks of these trees was cinnamon-colored. And the flowers above were cream fading to pink. Now, in the next picture, you can see that in the same spot, the rocks, the granites themselves, were pink and fading to... And what you're getting here, as were the flowers, they were pink, or were they yellow fading to pink. What you're getting is a wonderful combination of plants, just in miniature, in perfect harmony with itself. And I loved the idea of growing these flowers amongst amongst these trunks. And so we did the same thing at, at Wildside here. We're using magnolias here. I used white and pink ones in here. And these picking up the color of the erythroniums underneath them here. And you can see those trunks are beginning to just create the framework from which you can actually make a lovely, uh, a sort of naturalistic little tiny corner of the garden. Or in South Africa, how these blackened fire stems actually create this beautiful background for the little cotchula. I haven't used that one yet. It might be quite difficult to do it, but it's actually quite nice that you could do it. But on a smaller scale, here with the Erythronium helenae, just growing amongst the roots on a small scale in here. Just a little vignette of real beauty close up. Wisterias, I've done it with wisterias. We all know wisterias grow up and over our pergolas and against the side of our walls. But they also make really nice freestanding bushes. I'm not talking here about uh, standards or half standards. I'm talking about natural bushes. I actually let this branch grow out. And I love the trunks that you get on wisterias when they're getting big. And so I made a little wood of them, a little copse of them. I planted them on four-foot-high banks, and you can therefore walk underneath them. They just need a nice strong stake to start with to do it. But they actually create this, this is when it was fairly newly planted, this wonderful sort of canopy above, and the scent when it's in flower is just something else. But the thing is that you can grow a lot of plants underneath wisterias because they, they do leave gaps in between it so that you can actually grow things in there. Now, this is the field at Wildside when we went down there. Uh, when we left the garden house, we came down to Wildside, uh, and it was a flat field. Uh, and it's four acres, that's 200 yards long by 100 yards wide. Uh, you can see you've got one set of conditions in there. And we had a huge collection of woodland plants. Not exactly that south facing, not exactly the ideal conditions for growing them. So what we did is we came in and we stripped the soil off the whole site, 
piled it all up and I shaped the subsoil and then brought the soil back a little bit. And we created this series of dunes. Again, you can see the shape element of what I'm talking about coming in here. The beauty about this is that it creates shelter and it screens things instantly, absolutely instantly. You can plant trees and wait 10 years for them to grow up for your shelter belts, or you can make a pile of soil and create instant shelter. But it also means that things are thrown up into the air so that you get the light through them. And here, three years after the, for that last picture, you can see that the perennial plants are starting to cover the ground really all the way through that and looking really, uh, they're looking all right, they're looking quite nice. And then uh, three years further on again, same thing as what James was talking about, the number of varieties has fallen and the certain ones that have just taken over have grown bigger. So we've lost variety, but gained more stability in the process of what it is. And it pretty much looks after itself, apart from weeding in the spring. Ros will disagree with me wholeheartedly on that one. But it, it does, to a certain extent, it's become a lot more easy to maintain now that it's actually grown up a bit. And further down, we actually tried to save all the water that falls on all the roofs and all the and channel it down into a water garden, 100 meter longs at the bottom. There it is in the spring, and through the season, you can see that the perennial coming in through it now. And it's again from that picture there, that's when it's got a lot of variety in it. A couple of years later, you can see that it's actually just becoming a little bit a little bit like my waistline, a little bit fuller with age. And it's, it's just got a nice sort of relaxed sort of old sofa feel to it, really. Looking the other way, I put some standing stones in amongst some freestanding wisterias. Look, so that was the idea. And there were brewer's spruce in behind it so that the brewer's spruce hang down with age. The wisteria flowers hang down and you get the stones standing up like stalactites and stalagmites. And of course, the beauty of water. Water is always fantastic for wildlife. I mean, every pond should, every garden should have water if it possibly can. Now here, the idea has actually moved on a little bit here, because actually what we did at the garden house, in a way what I did was take a single area and actually try to create a garden that was modified. Never a copy of what I saw in the wild, but a, a, a sort of a feeling, an atmosphere, a spirit of what I saw in the wild. At wild side, it comes from a lot more different places. It's almost like you put lots of ideas into a blender and you come up with a smoothie version of it. It's reminiscent of all of them, but not a copy of any. This is the Mojave Desert in California, where actually the whole landscape, as far as the hills were concerned, were covered in these, pl in these flowers. The scent was sensational. And you get sort of damaged uh, lightning strike plants that are in amongst it. In, in South Africa, you get these quiver trees that are there. This is in the, in the wild, but then in the botanic garden, they use the same basic idea of a succulent plant under carpeted with flowers underneath it. In Bryce Canyon, you get these wonderful, towering sandstone cliffs. And when you look down, I mean, you can see there's a little pine tree there. Look, that's, that's about 60 feet high, just to give you some idea of the scale of them. I loved when you got down into the middle there that you actually had this sort of backdrop of, of flowers, uh, of, of the colors against the sandstone cliffs were looking terrific. I loved the fact that flowers, it's not just about the plants, it's what they grow in amongst. It's, that's just as important with the picture. I loved the way that this Babiena was creating shadows on that rock face underneath it. And here we had, this is where the nursery was at the garden house. We thought we'd just sort of change this all over. And so three months later, it had actually changed. We'd put a wall in there. You can see the color of the walls. We tried to mirror Bryce Canyon there. Uh, and the flowers, at this stage, I had actually planted a lot of cordylines in there. And the winter was terrible in 2010. Killed them to the ground immediately. But the wildflowers loved it. You can see they actually, not the wildflowers, the Schultzias and the Anthemis loved it in there. 
actually created really something. You can see the quarter lines are actually dead. My neighbor actually came around and said, that looks pretty awful, Keith. Looks like a fire's gone through that. I said, brilliant, Colin. That's just the feeling I want to get. I want it to look like it's phoenix, like rising from the ashes, okay? And you could grow things in amongst gravel that's slightly better than the gray stuff I had before. You can get the shadows against those walls. You can get the same element of light coming through the grasses. You can get, you can get the sort of uh, alpines, the helianthemums, the felicias running through in the courtyard garden here with the, st with the things behind. And you can see that it's still, this is just a courtyard garden here, just zipping through wonderful uh, kinocloa, kinocloa rubra, that grass, brilliant grass, that one. Just zip through, and you can see now the quarter lines have recovered and are actually really quite big now. And the next picture actually shows how, again, that variety of plants has diminished, but we've got a sort of different type of feeling. It's still, this was taken just a few weeks ago, it's just got a different ambient feeling to it now than it had before. And we'll come on to that last part, which all the piece that we've done so far is really quite, quite small. This is looking halfway up the slope of the canyons, what we took. There are, we, we, we dug seriously deep into the ground, right? I mean, there are 15 meter, 40 foot high banks that we've created from this flat field. Uh, and you can see that yellow mark in there is actually the height of a person. You're looking in there. This was going to be a natural swimming pool in here, right? That's what we dug it out for, six foot deep. I was going to put 15 tons of sand in there alongside and have my own beach. And on that little raised platform there, I was going to put a pirate's house on stilts. And it was going to be brilliant for the grandchildren. Didn't actually happen, actually. But there you go. Grandchildren aren't interested. That's why. But if you look into it, you can see that actually the hills are really quite large. And as you come through the season now, oh, actually, that was looking at that one there. That's coming through the season. But there's little canyons that are 25 foot high, a sort of six meters high in here. And look at all the screes and all the natural conditions you could grow things in there. I mean, it, you could grow some amazing things in there. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I planted some cistus. That's what I did that one for. Do you see the little cistus on the top? Cistus loved it. Look at them. Absolutely, I've never seen them growing like that. They're just growing in the shillet. Shillet's what we call the stone underneath. Just amazing. And they just, this is an area, that you can see the cistus there in flower this year. And this area here, we just filled up with perennial plants on a much larger scale. We filled it up with agapanthus, 100 different types of agapanthus in there, and grew them amongst the grasses. And they look pretty all right growing amongst the grasses. I have to say, I was quite pleased with that. And then, so the things like the crocosmias look good as well. And then further along on that same piece, later on, it comes with the Michaelmas daisies and the taller grasses, the miscanthus and things like that. And all of this is because they want light. Where I planted them initially down in the first part of the garden, the, the, the space has actually get, the trees are growing up and things are changing over. Up here, there are no trees to actually cut out the light. So they're actually mirroring the, the, the effect of where you see things growing like this in the Drakensberg with the agapanthus growing amongst shorter grasses on the mountain slopes there. And here, I want to finish with just a little group of, of, of things that I, in a way, a, a sort of a future scheme that is taking place that in a way joins together all the lines that I've talk, spoken about so far. That swimming pool that I talked about, that natural swimming pool, I've talked about it so much over the years to people that in a way it became reality to me in my head. Uh, and I was really quite ch pleased that I could change my mind because what I did is actually, I showed you this picture where I've made a sand bed before. I was very, very sad to leave the African garden at the garden house when we left. And I wanted to do, do it again. And I wanted to take Peter Korn's. I visited Peter Korn in Sweden, and I thought what he was doing was absolutely sensational, and you will see for yourself uh, later this afternoon that it is. Uh, but I loved the way that he actually ca carpeted the ground with these stones, this natural association of stones and things. And so I did it for myself on this little sand bed here, look. And you can see this was one I just did last autumn. And looking at it closely, you can see I can put some bulbs in there. It's a wonderful way to grow a lot of bulbs uh, uh, coming up through it. 
and I don't need to plant them quite as deeply as Peter does. But the key moment was seeing this picture in a book. It was in the Cape Bulbs book by Ma uh, Goldblatt and Manning. And it's, the Nuva it's in Newvertville, which is in South Africa, where the bulbs grow. And I never saw them growing with water in between. But as soon as I saw that picture, coupled with building that sand bed, that idea of the, of the natural swimming pool right out the window, gone immediately. And I felt really, really very proud of myself that I could jettison something like that. So this is about being flexible. It's just about being flexible and going with the flow to a certain extent. So this is gone. That's not going to happen. I'm going to fill that in to a certain extent and just have much smaller, shallower water that will pump and have crystal clear with stones underneath it. And there'll be a whole series of sand beds over this whole area here. And with, instead of that mass of flowers that we saw before, all right, I will see what you see as a rather more subtle variety. In lots and lots of places of semi-arid areas in the, in the world, you see grey-leaved plants actually growing in amongst it. That's what that one there was about. That's in South Africa. This is also in South Africa. It's not so bright as the other one, but it's still got the silver leaves in it. The Mojave Desert you still have these shrubs coming up through. And the, the color combinations are much more subtle, really, than that. I love the way that this little Californian poppy, this Eschortsia kispitosa, comes up through the stones. I love that. I thought that would work. So here, what's going to happen is that where that pirate's house was going to be up there, I shall make it lower, push it back into the bank, and there'll be a pavilion there that I can look in my hammock out from there outside and see all the shapes that there are outside and actually hopefully see flowers like this catching the light, bouncing off all that water and actually just putting sparkle and magic back into it. And at that point, I will stop. Thank you very much.